In the Japanese gaming scene, there are many established AA game development studios that have been around for many years. If you've played these Japanese games, you've likely played a game from many of these smaller companies. However, very few AA studios are truly independent. Many of them, like Acquire, Spike Chunsoft, and Aquaplus, are owned by larger companies, even though they operate autonomously. The most well-known truly independent Japanese developer is Nihon Falcom, given some of the classic IP they are responsible for. Among the other well-known AA developers though, is the subject of today's video, and is arguably the most beloved of them all, Vanillaware. If you're watching this video, you've likely already played one of their titles, or at least have some of them in your backlog, whether it's side-scrolling action RPG classics like Odin Sphere, the more unique strategy RPGs like Grim Grimoire, or the Fusion Noir hybrid that is 13 Sentinels. Vanillaware's catalogue may be small, but the breadth and quality of their games are not to be underestimated. While Vanillaware is primarily associated with Atlas, they have their own rich history, with Atlas playing merely a supporting role in a much larger story. This story is not just about Vanillaware, but also its founders, including the most well-known figure of Mole, George Kamitani. To celebrate the release of their newest title, Unicorn Overlord, I thought now was a perfect time to revisit the lengthy history of one of Japan's most beloved yet underappreciated developers, as well as every single game of theirs that they've ever made. Yep, every single one, including some developmental tidbits. Yeah, if the length of this video didn't make it clear, this is another marathon. It's time to take a deep dive into the many worlds and lore of Vanillaware. The story of Vanillaware is synonymous with its founder, George Kamitani. Now, George Kamitani goes by a variety of names. He's also known as Joji Kamitachi and uses this kanji for his name in Japanese media. This kanji can be pronounced as Moriharu, Morishi, or Joji. However, it's usually read as Joji. For ease of understanding, I'll refer to him here in this video as George Kamitani or Kamitani. Born in Hiroshima, Kamitani became fascinated with fantasy from an early age. When asked in a 2016 4 Gamer interview about his first exposure to fantasy, Kamitani named the PC-88 title The Black Oinks. Developed by Bulletproof Software, The Black Oinks is considered Japan's first major RPG, having originally been released in 1983 for the aforementioned PC-88. This title allows players to create a 5 member party to explore the dungeons beneath Utsuro, the in-game town. Players navigate six dungeons, building the stairway up to Oink's Tower in order to locate the Black Oinks required to end the curse, causing Utsuro's Eternal Night. Fun little side note, Bulletproof Software, despite being a studio located in Japan, was founded by a Dutch man known as Hank Rogers, who would go on to play a pivotal role in making Tetris a household name around the world. Anyway, back to the Black Oinks. This title is iconic in gaming history because it was critical in familiarising Japan with RPGs, inspiring a new generation of creatives and changing their lives forever, including George Kamitani. In high school, Kamitani worked part-time at a local software company that recently expanded into video game development following the success of the NES. This is where he learned a ton of game development skills, including pixel art and porting graphics. One title he worked on that he was particularly impressed with is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Hills Far for the NES. I'm not surprised he did draw all the graphics for that version. Moving into adulthood, Kamitani attended university in Japan before moving to Osaka. He soon got a job at Capcom in 1992 and lived through the phenomenal success of Street Fighter 2 first hand inside Capcom. Capcom were all about 2D fighters at the time, hence why Kamitani worked on Muscle Bomber for Body Explosion. Kamitani would also work on Dungeons & Dragons Tower of Doom throughout the latter half of that title's development. However, not long after development concluded, Kamitani decided to leave Capcom. According to a 2013 4 Gamer interview, yep there are multiple 4 Gamer interviews I'm citing here, he felt it wasn't possible to become a director at Capcom due to the sheer level of talent at the company. Kamitani did not believe he'd get a chance at a director's seat, and he forced himself to pitch a unknown girls fighting game project to then CEO Yoshiki Okamoto, which was unsuccessful. However, he still yearned to make his own game, so he left and he was finally free to do his own project. This project eventually became what we know today as Princess Crown. While Princess Crown is known outside Japan today as a classic Atlas RPG, while also being a vanilla title in all but name, the story of Princess Crown is a lot more complex than that. Princess Crown is the result of a years-long protracted development cycle that will instantly sound familiar to game developers today. This story is also deeply interlinked with the life of George Kamitani, so let's retell the story of Princess Crown from the very beginning. 
Shortly after leaving Capcom in 1993, Kamitani moved over to a small developer in the Kansai region of Japan. There are two noteworthy things about this developer. The first is that they are unnamed. Even the interviews I'm citing do not mention them at all, which is extremely strange. Secondly, this developer was originally an Arogi developer who invited Kamitani on because he expressed a desire to only do consumer titles, which is what is known in the visual community as All Ages from now on. So why did Kamitachi accept this invitation? He was already familiar with this company's work as he actually worked on a port for one of their adult games while at his part-time job in high school. And yeah, I was just as surprised as you are when I first read that. Princess Crown was originally envisioned as a multi-end training game similar to the Princess Maker franchise, but with the training portion replaced with action segments. At the time, Princess Maker 2 had just been released in Japan as this franchise was becoming increasingly popular, even though English-speaking regions would not get an official release until 2016. Due to both Sony and Sega seeking more RPGs for their respective platforms at the time, Kamitani incorporated RPG elements into the original plans and pitch for Princess Crown which Sega approved at the tail end of 1995. However, just a year later, Kamatachi's employer went bankrupt. This is the other reason they are nameless. Of course, as many today are sadly aware of, layoffs and job losses can happen very suddenly. In 1996, they still happened, although nowhere near the scale that they do now. Kamatani reached out to Sega to discuss this situation. At the time, because Sega and Bandai were negotiating a possible merger, Sega could not fund Princess Crown. However, in a huge twist of irony, Sega introduced Kamitani to a very special publisher who would later become their long-term collaborator, Atlas. As mentioned in my Growlinza video, Atlas were a well-known third-party publisher in Japan and sought new opportunities to publish titles from other developers. Even back in the 1990s, when they were independent companies, Sega and Atlas had a fantastic working relationship. Following negotiations between Kamitani and the two companies, Princess Crown's development costs will be funded by Atlas, and the game itself will be finished at Atlas's Osaka studio. Additionally, Sega would retain publishing duties for the game. As a result, Princess Crown was released exclusively on the Sega Saturn on the 11th of December 1997 in Japan. So now Princess Crown was out in the wild, it's time to talk about the game itself. This game stars Gradniel de Valendia, the Queen of the Kingdom of Valendia, she recently ascended to the throne following her mother. She sneaks out into the castle, into the wider kingdom to investigate and solve problems she has heard about. These various problems are caused by the mysterious demon Lauva, manipulating of humans. Lauva previously threatened the kingdom 25 years ago, when one of her servants sought out royal blood to attempt to revive Lauva. Gradual's mother, Elfaran, previously fought off this attack 25 years before the events of Princess Crown. Gradual runs into three other key characters on her journey, Portgus the Pirate, Edward the Knight, and Pro Pepina the Witch. Once players complete Gradual's story, campaigns for these other characters unlock. A fifth campaign unlocks upon completing all four previous campaigns, the stars Heimdall, and ties together the various plot points and revelations into the final route, which basically means this fifth route is the true ending of Princess Crown. As you can see by the gameplay, Princess Crown established many of the core fundamentals of Vanillaware titles. It's a 2D side-scrolling action RPG with beautiful hand-drawn graphics, beat-em-up gameplay, and multiple characters to play as. This is why many consider Princess Crown a proto-Vanillaware title, even though it came to life years before Vanillaware itself. One of the core fundamentals of Vanillaware titles established in Princess Crown is strong female characters, especially protagonists. In a 2017 Rolling Stones interview, which you can now only access via archive links, which is going to be a recurring theme in this video, Kamitani explains why he often creates strong female characters. He said, I'm in a state of arrested development at the age of 14, so it's probably just that I enjoy drawing girls more. Laughs. Seriously, in regards to Princess Crown, as I mentioned earlier, I was trying to be true to the style of the company I worked for, and that's why I chose to use a girl for the main character. If the main character is a girl, I thought I could make a game like Dragon Quest, with a visual style influenced by Alice in Wonderland. The reason I think I make girls with strong female characters is this. If a girl is forced to summon the courage to fight, she should be victorious. Princess Crown's legacy is not to be understated, although it did take time. Like most niche games, Princess Crown wasn't appreciated at all when it first came out. While this game has critical success, it unfortunately sold poorly leading to the cancellation of a planned sequel for the upcoming Sega Dreamcast. Over time, however, a fanbase would come to appreciate the charms of Princess Crown, especially its art style. 
for Sega Saturn physical release became exceedingly rare and expensive which is not common for Japanese games at all. Princess Crown also spawned both a spiritual successor and a planned sequel, both of which I'll detail later in the video. Another reason it took time for the world to appreciate Princess Crown's legacy is due to the lack of a worldwide release. That said, the rise of the internet and future PSP and PS4 ports meant more fans outside of Japan know this game exists. There have been attempts to translate the title into English, and while there are no translation patches available, full text translations do exist. One of these is a comprehensive guide, also only available via the Wayback Machine. This particular guide from what I've seen is missing some of the minor side content as well as the ending cutscene, guides for that exist on FAQs, otherwise this guide is pretty much complete. Even though Atlas would never localise the game, fans showed up to help make this game as accessible as possible for the worldwide fanbase. Fans know this game exists and deserve an official translation. In stark contrast, Kamatachi himself even expressed surprise that so many people know about Princess Crown now showing how Japanese creatives aren't always aware of how well known their works are overseas. The fact such an iconic title in video game history has never been officially localised is baffling, especially considering Vanillaware's prestige nowadays. But we do need to put it into context. At the time, not localising Princess Crown or even the PSP remake in the 2000s makes perfect sense. 2D side-scrolling action RPGs were still quite a niche and largely untested market outside of Japan. It wasn't until Enix's Valkyrie Profile came to North America in 2000 did a side-scrolling RPG develop any form of cult following outside of Japan. Princess Crown also went through a turbulent development period to release on a rapidly dying platform, especially outside of Japan, so a localization just wasn't financially feasible. However, some form of official confirmation would later surface in two unusual places. The first source is a 2005 one-up preview for the PSP port. In this preview, it stated Atlas USA was considering a North American release, but Sony's content approval process may block the release. The second source is from a 2009 interview where George Kamatani himself cited the game's age as to why Princess Crown would not see an overseas release, and at that time, Princess Crown was 12 years old. A third reason floating around the internet is that Atlas lost Princess Crown source code, but this has never been confirmed. It is plausible though, because this has happened with other classic titles. The most well-known example is the original Kingdom Hearts by Squaresoft. In terms of Sega titles, Panzer Dragoon Saga, another rare Sega Saturn title, also falls into this category. At this point, it's safe to assume an official remake is likely the only way this title will ever see an English release. Given how much Atlas love remaking their games, I think this scenario is quite possible in the future. Like many niche RPGs, this title had the odds stacked against it, and it really shows. However, these odds definitely favoured Princess Crown. As for George Kamatani's career, well, that one's a little more complex. Following Princess Crown's release, Kamatani's circumstances were still very unstable. Due to Princess Crown's poor commercial performance on the Saturn, George and the rest of the team were actually blacklisted in the Japanese games industry. This made it difficult to find work. However, Kamatani did manage to land jobs with three partners. The first was Rakshin, formerly Rakdim. Rakjin helped develop some games you've played over the years, ranging from multiple Bomberman and titles to fan translated RPGs like Archaic Sealed Heat for the Nintendo DS. The second was Sony Computer Entertainment, back when they cared about anything that's not over budgeted Western AAA blockbusters. The final partner was Enix, who hired Kamatani to help develop what was quite a small project but would eventually become one of the most popular MMOs of the 2000s Fantasy Earth Zero. Originally titled Fantasy Earth The Ring of Dominion, this title was slated as a small project. However, it soon required its own studio to manage production. Kamitani, alongside artist Shigitake, whom Kamitani met while freelancing, and programmer Kentaro Onishi co-founded Paraguru in 2002. This studio would be renamed Vanillaware in 2004, but for ease of understanding, I will use the name Paraguru when discussing Fantasy Earth. Before that, let's take a little moment to dive into Vanillaware's other co-founders. We know about Kanatami's background, but what about Shigatake and Kentaro Onishi? Starting with Onishi, he is not as well known as Kamitani. This is because he tends to stay out of the spotlight, and in fact, his first interview with non-Japanese media wouldn't be until 2016 with Eurogamer, so it's not surprising you haven't heard of him. His early career started at Rakjin, whom shared the same offices as Atlas Osaka back then. He ported R-Type to the original PlayStation. He and Kamitani used to play StarCraft together at lunchtime, which is how they first met and became friends. They also eventually become co-collaborators, initially as freelancers. However, 
he would go on to serve as a planner and programmer for Vanillaware's games ever since. Onishi's gaming influences include Street Fighter 2 and being a child of the Famicom generation in the 1980s. However, he also practiced programming on the NEC PC-98. This is a tangent, but I really wanted to share this quote from the Eurogamer interview as it's a really interesting peek into how game programmers learnt the ropes back then. The hardware I used back then wasn't even Windows based, it was NEC's PC-9821. It was the first time I delved into PCs, but at the time the machine cost more than 300,000 yen, so I couldn't afford it by myself and had a hard time convincing my parents that it was necessary. Even though the resolution was 600 by 400 which was considered high for the time, it was different from DOS slash V in that it couldn't display pixels individually and could only display 16 colours. It wasn't really a machine geared for games and was very standard for its time, but there were many hooks about the hardware and I felt the configuration was straightforward. Rather than actually gaming on the machine, I remember spending more time creating a system that displayed sprites, a tool for making sprites, and a map editor. As for Shigetake, he is the least well known of the three co-founders, and that's in part because he has a minimal presence outside of Japanese media. You've almost certainly seen his art though. While most of his main projects have been for Vanillaware, he has also drawn art for a variety of companies and products, ranging from Fake Grand Order to multiple Etrian Odyssey titles. He's even contributed to some Aquaplus fanbooks and Sega soundtrack covers. This guy dabbles in everything, and yes, that includes some adult works too, including the adult crime simulation game Mahiru no Adoru Hanzaisha. Seriously, this guy has a surprisingly lengthy and detailed track record, which is quite shocking considering how little we know about him outside of Japan. He's got a massive list of works written on his personal website, quite fitting for an artist who's been active since 1999. More recently though, he's been working more on direct game development instead of freelancing for others, having heavily contributed to Aslibra's Revision, which is available on Switch and Steam. He's also known for assisting with the designs for Habanero Tan, the unofficial mascot of a popular pepper-flavoured snack brand sold in Japan. This kind of arrangement is more common than you'd expect within Japan. He also runs a dojin circle with two other men, something else which will be relevant later. Back to Fantasy Earth Zero. What is this game even about? In this MMO, players choose one of five nations within Malfaria to ally and fight with. This game's lore began as a conflict between humans and vampires. However, once Kamatani became involved, this concept changed to a battle between various kingdoms held by princesses, which is peak vanillaware, I mean Panguru. This game is comparatively light on story compared to Vanillaware's other works, because this game's story was intended to come from the players battling each other, not an overall narrative. Yet, players versus player battles form a large part of the gameplay loop. However, an option to fight hordes of monsters in the world around them also exists, similar to what the kids call a horde mode. There's also a tower defense-esque portion of the title, where players use resources from crystals found on the field to build and forge fortifications to defend their home base. Monster summons are also possible in these battles. While I'm not too familiar with MMOs or early 2000s PC RPGs, these gameplay features seem to resemble similar titles from the time, like RuneScape. Regarding presentation, an interesting aspect of this title's release was how much art was recycled from a game we didn't know publicly existed at the time. Dragon's Crown through the Dreamcast. Due to that game's cancellation, Kamatani chose to recycle the art for this game instead. A notable example is that the female warrior design on the game's box art. I'll talk more about Dragon's Crown later in the video, as, as you all know, it's been revived. Additionally, players' avatars are fully customizable, allowing them to choose their gender, class, weapon type, and starting nations. Unfortunately, relations between Kamitani, Panguru, and the recently merged Square Enix deteriorated. This is because Kamitani believed Square Enix took control of the project away from him. This led Kamitani and Panguru moving on from Fantasy Earth Zero in 2004 in favour of other projects. Although Panguru's involvement with Fantasy Earth Zero came to an end, the title itself went on to have a long service life. Following Panguru's departure, Square Enix handed development duties over to a studio called Multiterm, which then completed development following other difficulties related to the game's scope. This title was first released as a paid title in February 2006, which used a monthly subscription model and the then brand new Play Online system Square Enix used throughout the 2000s for their online games, most notably Final Fantasy XI. However, Low subscription numbers meant that in November 2006, Square Enix transferred ownership and control of the project to a company called GamePot. 
GamePot converted the game into a free-to-play model with a regular update development structure. This relaunch hugely benefited Fantasy Earth Zero as it became more popular, peaking over a million active players. It also got two mobile game spin-offs and multiple collaborations with other franchises, including Nihon Falcom's Trails series. The free-to-play version was localised for North America and released in May 2010, but it closed less than a year later. This pattern is remarkably similar to Square Enix's mobile game development in recent years. Due to its minimal presence outside of Japan, most people don't know much at all about Fantasy Earth Zero, despite its pivotal role in forming Vanillaware. Before researching this video, I didn't even believe this title was localised, for example. In Japan, the game lasts much longer and shut down in September 2022, not even two years after this video's production. That's an impressive service life for any online game, and is comparable to Disney's Club Penguin, another online free-to-play game that lasted a very long time. The length also rivals that of Vanillaware itself. This is very ironic, as if it wasn't for George Kamitani and the rest of the initial Vanillaware team weaving their influence back in the early 2000s, Fantasy Earth Zero likely would not have lasted as long as it did. And this is before diving to Square Enix repeating the same tactics. They used to save Fantasy's Earth Zero with a title you will have definitely have heard of, Final Fantasy XIV, which could argue is down to Vanillaware's influence as well, but that is definitely up for debate. Now that Vanillaware is an independent company, it's time to touch on their next steps. But first, we need to answer an important question. Why did Kamitani pick Vanillaware as the new name for his company? In a 2009 Nintendo Power interview, when asked about what the name Vanillaware means, he said, Vanilla ice cream is the ice cream flavour with the most enduring popularity. I would like to create games that have stability like that of vanilla ice cream. And vanilla ice cream is really good, so I approve of that. Additionally, remember how Kamitani worked on Muscle Bomber at Capcom? Well, it was during this time he gathered the experience required for he to form Vanillaware's 2D tools, which is basically what they use to put the arms, legs and bodies of all the characters together. This is particularly relevant to future works going forward, as this is when Vanillaware's distinctive 2D art style really began to come together, especially given this style was being developed during the rise of 3D gaming production. This technique became known as multi-jointing. Now this next part is going to get a little bit confusing. Normally when I do these lengthy retrospectives, I prefer to go by release date order. However, Vanillaware's first two titles were released the same year on the PlayStation 2, but the dates are a bit out of order, as one of these games was initially delayed by the publisher. So the simultaneous release of that game came after the Japanese release date for the other title? Yeah, it's a bit confusing. Therefore, I'm going to focus on the game Vanillaware completed development on first, and then went on to really establish themselves not just in Japan, but worldwide. Yep, I'm talking about Odin Sphere. Of all of Vanillaware's earliest works, Odin Sphere is the most well known of all. This title originally debuted quite late in the PlayStation 2's life. It was originally envisioned as a direct sequel to Princess Crown, although it soon turned into a more standalone spiritual successor. Set on the land of Orion, this magical kingdom is home to five nations. Two of them, Ragnar Nival and Ringford, fight for control over the mysterious Crystallization Cauldron. This is a weapon created by the Kingdom of Valentine, which now lies in ruins following the authoritarian rule of, well, King Valentine. The story is a lot deeper and more complex. There are other kingdoms not directly involved in the war, there are fairies and other magical creatures, and there's a truly beautiful game with an interesting and captivating world, inspired by Norse mythology. This world is explored in a 2D side-scrolling perspective with hand-drawn characters, enemies and environments. In this game, characters use a combination of regular attacks and special skills from their ciphers. These ciphers can be upgraded via phosons, which you get in battle in place of experience points. You also get ranked in battles, and the higher you rank, the more points you earn. Stages also include a boss at the end, which upon its defeat, clears the chapter. Many of these conventions carry over to future Vanillaware titles and became the most iconic formula most people who play Vanillaware games in the 2000s and early 2010s associate with the developer. Another Vanillaware staple that's also added here is cooking. Yep, Vanillaware and its gorgeous food-based art all started in this game. Atlas acquired publishing rights to Odin Sphere in 2004, shortly after Vanillaware departed from Fantasy Earth. Connections at Atlas allowed Kamatachi to overcome the stigma he had in Japan as a result of Princess Crown's failure. Development for Odin Spear was difficult due to the technical limitations of trying to cram so much high quality art and assets into this late PlayStation 2 release. Hence the team had to make some compromises in order to do so. There are some interesting tidbits regarding the western localization are worth touching on too. 
At the time, Odin Sphere was a very unusual project for Atlas as it would be a simultaneous worldwide release of a game by a studio that's not well known outside of Japan. To help make this game more approachable for a Western audience, the localization team aimed to give the title a Shakespearean feel, inspired by the famous English playwright. This game also had much more voice acting than your typical Atlas localization, which was further complicated by technical limitations as a result of the character text bubbles being designed for kanji, not romanized characters. Finally, there is the matter of the European release. This version was published in 2008 by Square Enix, which was their first ever third party release. Additionally, they would also add French, German, Spanish and Italian translations for this release, a first for Atlas. It wouldn't be till the late 2010s that multiple European languages, as well as Japanese audio, yep, that was also included in all worldwide versions of Odin Sphere, became standard in Atlas titles. Odin Sphere received largely positive feedback. The art and story were highly praised, as well as the unique combat system. However, the difficulty was criticised, as well as some repetition within the combat. Additionally, technical slowdown was another big issue reviewers took issue with. Despite all these drawbacks though, Odin Sphere brought the Vanillaware brand into the hearts and minds of RPG fans to this day. As it was quite a late PS2 release, it became a hidden gem on the PS2 back in the day, loved by those who played it, but forgotten by everyone else. However, there's one aspect of Odin Sphere's history on the PS2 I haven't touched on yet. While the development of Odin Sphere concluded in 2006, Atlas delayed the release to 2007 in order to not cannibalise their other titles. This delay led to other complications because Vanillaware had to commence new projects in the meantime in order to keep the company alive. Atlas refused to take on any more Vanillaware projects until they got solid sales figures for Odin Sphere. Fortunately, Odin Sphere sold well, but it was a bit unfair for Atlas to put Vanillaware in this position to begin with as Vanillaware did not delay the game. In the end, Vanillaware got two different projects greenlit by two different publishers, one for the PlayStation 2 and the other for the Nintendo Wii. Let's start with the PS2 project that also came out in 2007, the 2D real-time strategy game Grim Grimoire. The history of this title starts with another third party, Nippon Ichi Software. It turns out the then president, Sohei Nikawa, was a fan of Princess Crown. After discovering that the team behind Princess Crown formed Vanillaware, Nikawa contacted them as he was interested in a collaboration. In a 2013 Dengeki interview, Nikawa explained a bit more about NIS's strategy at the time. NIS was becoming more receptive to working with other developers to create all new games rather than just porting existing titles to consoles. Some of these titles you might have heard of, such as Tristia of the Deep Blue Sea and Azealia of the Eternal. They established a long-running partnership with the vision novel developer Fog, most known for the Furaiki series, whom they later acquired in the 2010s following the death of its founder. Most relevant for this video, however, is their partnership with Vanillaware. The result of this partnership is Grim Grimoire. Released in Japan on the 12th of April 2007, and then on the 26th of June later that year in North America, Grim Grimoire is one of the most unique RPGs in Vanillaware's history. Vanillaware had full creative freedom with this new title, with Nipponichi Software taking on publishing duties and supervision. Grim Grimoire is essentially Vanillaware's take on StarCraft, crossed with the settings found in a certain wizard franchise corrupted by its maker, and the then unlocalized Atelier Marie, the Alchemist of Salberg. All of this is quite fitting. Given Kamitani's history, you pay as Lilith Blan, a young student studying at the Tower of Silver Star, where the game takes place. On her fifth day, Lilith awakens to discover the tower is under attack by the recently released Spirit of Calvaris, an evil wizard seeking the Philosopher's Stone. Oh, for the love of... Calvaro kills all the teachers. But before he can end Lilith too, the clock strikes midnight, and she is thrust back in time to her first day. Lilith has to solve the mysteries of the school and put an end to this new threat throughout this time-travelling RTS. The development history of Grim Grimoire was turbulent in multiple ways. Financially, Kamitane had to take out a loan worth 20 million Japanese yen to ensure Vanillaware could stay afloat. This is because Grim Grimoire's development costs drained Vanillaware's finances completely. Due to the aforementioned delays with Odin Sphere, this game released in Japan first on the 12th of April 2007, but then released in North America on the 26th of June 2007, after Odin Sphere's Japanese and American release dates. Although it did release in Europe first in September 2007, whereas Odin Sphere didn't come to Europe until March 2008, so there's some consistency I suppose? Yeah, these companies are confusing as hell sometimes. Ironically, this conclusion also extends to the gameplay. Given it's an RTS, Vanillaware had the unique task of bringing over gameplay normally seen exclusively on PC to consoles. However, given the relative nicheness of RTS and PC gaming in Japan, this led to difficulties translating the difficulty over to a Japanese audience. 
This is something Kamitani commented on in an interview with Glixel. He says, The majority of gamers in Japan have never played an RTS before, so Nipponichi asked us to lower the difficulty setting. We had to change the easy mode to normal and normal to hard. We also added a sweet level, which was even easier than easy mode. At the time, we were hesitant to make a game so easy because we were still new at making games. However, Grim Grimoire performed poorly, which meant Nipponichi was not interested in future collaborations with Vanillaware. This was very unfortunate for Kamitani, as he considers Grim Grimoire to be one of his personal favourite stories that he's ever written. He loved it so much he already planned sequels. This situation influenced Kamitani's future works, as from this point on, he aimed to produce stories that could fully stand alone in case a similar situation happened again. Now we move along to what is arguably the most obscure Vanillaware title ever made, Kumatachi. Kumatachi, roughly translated as Kumatan Zoo, is a life simulation game that released on the Nintendo DS in Japan on the 25th of September 2008. This title marked Vanillaware's debut on a Nintendo platform. It is also the only Vanillaware title to not get any form of English translation, whether officially or via fans. The reason why will become clear soon enough. Before we go over Kumatachi itself, I need to briefly explain a couple of other things that at first glance seem irrelevant. The first is the studio that later became the development partner for Kumitachi, Ashinaga or Jisan. This is a three man development studio run by three people known as Uncles A, B, and C. One of these uncles, Uncle B, is Shigatake, the same guy who co founded Vindleware. Yep, this is the Dojin studio I referenced when discussing him earlier. The three uncles released a handful of games throughout the 2000s, all of which are obscure titles. One of these titles, Habanero Tanhouse, is the source material that inspired Kumitachi. It's a virtual pet management game, although in this case, Habanero-san is the pet. It's intended to serve as a cute distraction title that you log into when you want to relax at the end of the day. Kind of like Animal Crossing if that makes sense. It's quite a simplistic looking title, but looks pretty wholesome at first glance. Habanero Tanhouse, while not developed by Vanillaware themselves, served as a source material for the game we're discussing here. Kumitachi was a joint venture between Vanillaware Ashinaga Oji-san and Dimple Entertainment, the latter of whom is a short-lived Japanese game developer and publisher from the late 2000s. In Kumitachi, you play as a caretaker at a zoo. This zoo houses anthropomorphic young girls who live in the zoo on a real-time cycle over two weeks in the real world. Players are meant to keep checking back every day to help care for Kumitan, interact with her and raise her standing within the zoo. Additionally, Players can interact with other animals in the zoo, claim rewards and reflections on Kumatan's progress and influence her mood in other ways. Shigatake served as both the director and character designer throughout this project due to the lack of staff Vanillaware had available. This was a period when Vanillaware experimented with developing two projects at the same time. The other project you probably already know about, which I'll discuss next, took up the bulk of resources. So why wasn't this game released outside of Japan? Well you might have already noticed the reason based on what really said about the game, but there is another reason. You see, both Kumatachi as well as Habanero Tea House feature a mechanic where you can either praise Kumatan by patting her head or flick her head to discipline her. In other words, content that would court controversy outside of Japan for obvious reasons. Publishers at the time knew this too. When asked directly about whether Kumatachi would get a localization, George Kamatani himself said, and I quote, Do you know about Kumatachi? They told me that I couldn't bring over that game to the US because it's not good to train little girls in that way. Hell. Bear in mind this was back in the late 2000s. This was before niche game publishers attempted to push boundaries by localizing niche Japanese titles that feature any kind of punishment mechanics towards young looking characters. One example with similar mechanics that you might know about which is much darker is Nipponichi's Criminal Girls franchise. This courted a lot of controversy and censorship during the localization in the mid 2010s and is also likely why that franchise has never made a comeback. Kumitachi is unlikely to ever come back in any form, not just because of the realities of localizing for content, but also because the game did not perform well critically or commercially either. The final reason is that of the three parties involved in Kumitachi's creation, only Vanillaware remains active. Dimple Entertainment closed its doors in August 2010, while the Ashinaga or Jisan Dojin Circle remains inactive, although you can still access their website today. If Kumitachi did ever get remastered and localized though, a potential localization would require significant content changes by both ratings boards and storefronts. Maybe one day a fan translation might release, but that remains unlikely. Kumitachi itself is very much a cure of its time. It reflects the management and development structures at Vanillaware, as well as shows the kind of content Japanese creatives outside of PC were willing to consider putting into their games. 
It is merely a footnote in VanillaWare's history, however, because following Kumitachi, they'd release their next major work that would truly mark a turning point for the developer's history. Alongside Odin's Sphere, Muramasa, known as Oiburo Muramasa Yotoden in Japan, is the other Vanillaware game that really helped the studio build a following in the late 2000s. The first reason is the platform choice, the Nintendo Wii. The Wii wasn't exactly known for its RPGs. Before we had the likes of Xenoblade Chronicles, Circle Wars Along My Love, or The Last Story, it was really slim pickings for Nintendo fans back then. Muramasa the Demon Blade was exactly the kind of game the platform needs. Vanillaware chose to develop this game for the Wii because the specs were similar to the PS2, a console they were already familiar with. Additionally, due to Atlas's refusal to accept any more Vanillaware projects before Odin Sphere's release, Vanillaware had to look for another publisher. Marvelous Entertainment liked the project, so they agreed to co-fund and publish the game. Muramasa was released in Japan on the 9th of April 2009, before Marvelous licensed the title to Ignition Entertainment and Rising Star Games for worldwide release. Exceed Games were originally due to publish the game in North America, but Ignition took over as a result of a bidding war between themselves, Atlas, and Exceed. This rights transfer was amicable however, and actually helped the game long term. This was because Ignition could market the game much more effectively than Exceed. Exceed had a very crowded Wii lineup at the time, so this decision made a lot of business sense for them as well. For those not aware, Muramasa is set on the island of Honshu in Edo period Japan. Players follow the perspectives of dual protagonists Kosuke and Monohime who are navigating the conflict of the Demon Blades. This conflict was caused by the ruling shogun Tokugawa Tsunayoshi's thirst for power. This was an epic historical adventure set in, well, historical Japan. It's a very unique setting, but when combined with Vanillaware's beautiful art style, made Muramasa a truly memorable title. Muramasa was a turning point for Vanillaware in many ways, which I think is best summed up with this comment by Kentaro Onishi in that Eurogamer interview. When asked what Vanillaware title has a special place in his heart, he said, hmm, as a programmer, probably Muramasa. For the world setting and game system, I would say Dragon's Crown. But after some of the negative comments regarding the PS2 version of Odin Sphere, Mr. Kamatani and I racked our brains, and Muramasa was the title where we totally changed our thinking regarding programming structures and games. There was so much trial and error with Muramasa, I have a special attachment to it. This drastic shift led to Vanillaware spending lots of time and resources on development to ensure Muramasa's gameplay was as best as it could possibly be. This includes addressing the negative feedback the studio received from Odin Sphere, especially relating to that game's difficulty. However, this did come at a cost. The developers became exhausted as a result of Muramasa's development, meaning an external company took on debugging on Vanillaware's behalf. This labour of love was worth the time and energy though. Muramasa the Demon Blade generally received positive praise from critics and fans and sold within expectations, according to the game's North American publisher. Marvelous Entertainment took a slightly more negative angle though, although to be fair, their reasons make sense. They believe Muramasa got low sales within Japan, North America and Europe because of the title being quote unquote non-traditional on top of its platform choice. To be fair, the Wii, like all home consoles at the time, was not an RPG powerhouse, nor would it ever become one. However, thanks to Nintendo's own offerings down the line, more RPG fans began to dig into the Wii's library, and by extension GameCube through backwards compatibility. Muramasa the Demon Blade was thrust into the spotlight as a result. The theme of time also applies to Muramasa's legacy. When people talk about Vanillaware, Muramasa is among the games most frequently brought up. Even though Muramasa didn't perform the best commercially at the time, the game's development cycle deeply impacted the company and its future works, leading to better games long term. One of those future titles is Muramasa Rebirth, the enhanced port of Muramasa for the PS Vita, which I'm going to come back to later in the video. The next Vanillaware title I'm discussing now is their second PSP title and last Japanese exclusive title, Grand Nice History. Directed by Tomohiko Deguchi, this 2D side-scrolling strategy RPG was released in Japan on the 1st of September 2011. Marvelous Entertainment handled publishing duties for this title, and it would be their second collaboration following Muramasa's director Yoshifumi Hashimoto personally reaching out to Vanillaware regarding a second collaboration. Additionally, Koichi Mainu returned from Grim Grimoire to design the characters. He worked really hard to emulate the fantasy art style normally associated with Western fantasy, and by extension Vanillaware's earlier titles. Set in the work of Rhystia, Grand Knight's history tells the story of three kingdoms at war with each other. Logres, the Ancient Kingdom, Union, the Kingdom of Knights, and Avalon, the Kingdom of Magic. Players adopt the role of a commander of a newly formed group of knights who align with one of these three kingdoms. The goal of this new team is to complete campaigns for their kingdom, 
including collecting ancient relics known as the Saint's Treasures. It's a pretty simple sounding premise, but it's enough to set the scene for this epic adventure. One of the most unique aspects of Grand Knight's history is its usage of multiplayer features. Grand Knight's history's multiplayer is a hybrid of online gaming structures as well as wireless email communication, intended to keep players synchronised in a server, even when they're offline. Additionally, Vanillaware liaised with Sony directly at the time regarding development for this relatively niche game, something that would not happen today. Because Grand Knight's history was Vanillaware's first turn-based RPG, there was a steep adjustment process towards developing this new style of game, this includes adapting the art style to better suit turn-based games instead of the action RPGs Vanillaware is accustomed to. Grand Knight's history's legacy is twofold. The first example is a game remembered as an often forgotten gem because of the circumstances regarding its English release outside of Japan. Yep, although this game was announced for a release in both North America and Europe by Exceed Games and Rising Star Games respectively, this release was later cancelled. Why was this? One of the moves practically unheard of in the games industry, Exceed Games clarified why they had to cancel Grand Knight's History's localization. They said, Exceed Games has confirmed it will not publish Grand Knight History in North America as previously announced. Unfortunately, it was determined that development resources required to localize the game were not available, necessitating its cancellation. We regret not being able to bring the game to our fans, but we are committed to our 2012 lineup and look forward to showing more of these games in the coming weeks and months. Although the reason why development resources is not explicitly stated within this statement, the reason why is because Vanillaware were dedicated all its resources to developing its next title, Dragon's Crown. Of course, developing an all new game takes priority compared to localising an older title in many cases, so Vanillaware's decision is understandable. However, given that Dragon's Crown would later get finished and that XC's English translation was apparently almost done, why didn't Vanillaware go back to program the English release of Grand Knight's history afterwards? Well, we never got a direct answer regarding that, I think the PSP dying for niche RPGs is the most likely reason. This whole situation is unfortunate given that localization companies aim to avoid announcing anything unless they're confident they can release games with as much concrete information as possible. This is one reason you see publishers say they have no plans to release games they haven't formally announced via their pre-arranged marketing strategies. Therefore, Grand Knight's history situation is extremely unusual. A positive of this whole mess, however, is the hardworking fans who stepped up to translate the game themselves into English. After two partial patches, a third and final full translation patch became available for fans to download in 2014. It's now possible to play the whole offline portion of Grand Knight's history, well, offline. The online portion was translated but not tested during the patch's development. This isn't surprising, but also doesn't really matter at this point considering the servers are likely down anyway, that doesn't take away from the great achievement the fan translation team successfully achieved by bringing one of Vanillaware's more obscure titles into English. After all, the critical reception for this game has been positive, both in Japan as well as worldwide by those who've played it. What it is somewhat more remembered for is the spiritual successor it inspired. Following Grand Knight's history's release, Deguchi had more ideas for his own titles. In order to make them a reality, he left Vanillaware and founded his own company, Monochrome Corporation. The end result was Grand Kingdom. This is a game that resembles Grand Knight's history closely, but is quite different in many ways, because it focuses on lifetime action rather than turn-based tactics. Spike Chunsoft published this game in Japan in 2015 for the PlayStation 4 and PS Vita, and as America localized the game into English the following year. At this point, Grand Kingdom is somewhat forgotten as well, Monochrome never brought the game to PC or other platforms, or released anything else at all for that matter, so nowadays your best option for experiencing this gem is tracking down a physical copy of the PlayStation 4 version. It's time to finally talk at length about another one of Vanillaware's most well-known titles, Dragon's Crown. Although Dragon's Crown was originally released for the PS3 and PS Vita, its development history runs back much farther than that era. It is arguably the most turbulent of all of Vanillaware's titles up to this point, and I don't just mean the character designs, but we'll get to that. Dragon's Crown was originally envisioned as a fully 3D sequel to Princess Crown for the Sega Dreamcast. However, due to the circumstances of both Vanillaware and the Dreamcast back in the day, this concept was scrapped. It was also intended to emulate the gameplay of a title Kamitani worked on back during his Capcom days, Dungeons and Dragons Tower of Doom. Kamitani pitched Dragon's Crown throughout the 2000s to many publishers, including Capcom ironically enough, before UTV Ignition Entertainment, an Indian game publisher that was owned by the Walt Disney Company, picked up the game. Ignition went bankrupt way back in 2011, so if you've never heard of them, don't worry about it. Although I can't really say it for Vanillaware at the time, as Ignition's bankruptcy forced them to seek another publisher. Therefore, Vanillaware returned to their old friends at Atlas to ask them to take Ignition's place by providing funding, publishing and development support. 
Atlas agreed, not only because of their past working relationship, but also because Dragon's Crown was already far into development. Therefore, Atlas would not have to allocate as many resources to finishing Dragon's Crown compared to Odin's Sphere or even Princess Crown. In the case of Dragon's Crown, the Persona team provided development assistance, led by former Persona series director Katsura Hashino. However, in another twist of fate, Atlas themselves became at risk of bankruptcy in 2013. Unlike Ignition Entertainment, however, Atlas survived thanks to Sega buying the company and securing all their current and future projects, including Dragon's Crown. Despite all these challenges, Vanillaware and Atlas completed and released Dragon's Crown for the PS3 and PS Vita in Japan on the 25th of July 2013. While Dragon's Crown in its initial incarnation was envisioned for the Xbox 360, this platform choice was changed to PlayStation hardware in order to utilise the online connectivity features, cross-platform support with the then new PS Vita, as well as to compete with the Monster Hunter series. This however is quite ironic given that Monster Hunter recently shifted towards the Nintendo 3DS in Japan, effectively meaning Dragon's Crown competed with other Monster Hunter-esque titles from other companies instead such as Sony's Freedom Wars. Now to finally detail Dragon's Crown's world and gameplay. You play as adventurer. You can select one of many possible characters and classes. You enter the realm of Hydeland and then get involved in the conflict affecting this world. Setting up a base at a town within the heart of Hydeland, players can prepare their equipment and interact with NPCs, accept requests at taverns and more before going out to explore the world around them through navigating dungeons. Players navigate these dungeons through a 2D side-scrolling perspective, beating up various monsters and navigating multiple pathways along the way, all to collect various treasures and defeat bosses before returning to base. There are also hidden areas and an alternative path, the latter of which opens up on follow-up playthroughs. Yep, there's a lot of roguelike elements as well. Side quests are also available as well as the ability to revive people after finding their bones in dungeon, as well as cooking, another vanillaware staple. Dragon's Crown's gameplay resembles that of a beat-em-up more than an RPG, something George Kamitani credits Kentaro Onishi for. There's a lot to talk about regarding Dragon's Crown's localization and reception, starting with localizations, which was marred with controversy and challenges in its own right. As mentioned earlier, the consequences of Dragon's Crown's turbulent development forced Exceed Games to cancel the localization of Grand Knight's history. This is further complicated by the fact it's Vanillaware's first ever HD game, and Japanese developers typically struggled with HD development during this generation. Dragon's Crown was Vanillaware's most expensive game at that point, with George Kamatani himself confirming the game's budget exceeded $100 million. And given that picture I've just shown on screen, now's the perfect time to return to the land of controversy. While Dragon's Crown became immediately popular upon its release, selling over 400,000 copies, as well as receiving positive praise from critics and fans, Dragon's Crown was criticised for its overly sexualised character designs. The sorceress and Amazon characters were singled out in particular, as for individual critiques, the most well-known critique is a Kotaku article by the well-known journalist Jason Schreier. This article, titled Game Developers Really Need to Stop Letting Teenage Boys Design Their Characters, was a news report covering the latest Dragon's Crown promotional trailer at the time. In Schreier's own words, he explained, It was a snarky short article written to point out the game's voluptuous, hyper-sexualized sorceress character but looks like it came out of the notebook doodles of a teenage heterosexual male. As you can see, I wrote, the sorceress was designed by a 14 year old boy. This quote comes from a follow up article titled, The Real Problem with That Controversial Sexy Video Game Sorceress, which Shry himself written as a result of the controversy the initial article caused. As part of this controversy from the original article, George Kamatani himself made it worse. In result to Shry's article, Kamatani posted a hand drawn image of three overly musculized men on his Facebook page with the caption, it seems that Mr. Jason Schreier of Kotaku is pleased also with neither Sorceress nor Amazon. The art of the direction which he likes was prepared. This response was not only unprofessional, but also homophobic, due to how gay people are often used as a punchline. Former Gamatsuta writer and gay man Christian Nutt explains why in an article you can find on the Wayback Machine. I recommend you read the full thing, but to save time, I'm just going to give an extract. It's not intended to hurt anyone's feelings, but that's the problem with it. If the person who makes the joke assumes it doesn't hurt anybody, it's because he's assuming that nobody who might conceivably be hurt by it is paying attention. Either he thinks Dragon's Crown isn't for them, or he thinks they don't like video games, or that they don't even exist. Who knows what? To Kamatani's credit, he did personally apologise to Shry himself following this article's publication. Given how much time has passed since then, I hope he's learned his lesson not just about being professional, but also about diversity. 
As a side note however, I do strongly recommend reading Schreier's follow-up article outlining the issue with the art as well as what it means. Even though it was written in 2014, and sexism within the video game industry does still exist and is a big problem despite the progress made, however I don't want to deviate any further as that's a topic for another video, so let's move on. Dragon's Crown itself left a rich history. It shows VanillaWare continuing to broaden out into new genres, incorporate online multiplayer within their games, break new ground through HD development, and so much more. This game also saw well and would go on to see a re-release, which I'll discuss in a bit. Additionally, because Dragon's Crown was one of the first Japanese RPGs to be localised on the PS Vita, that fanbase rallied around the game as well as VanillaWare themselves. This would pay dividends down the line because it would help grow the company's fanbase, both within and outside Japan. Now we're going to touch on a part of VanillaWare's history I'm terming the Remake Era. This is because following Dragon's Crown, VanillaWare would not release any original title until 2019, when 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim was released in Japan. This title had a long troubled development cycle, it was originally announced for both PS4 and Vita before the Vita version was cancelled after years of silence. This long development cycle meant it was safe to assume VanillaWare was having trouble developing the game, and because of this, VanillaWare had to work on other projects to ensure money kept coming in, and naturally, remakes were among the most viable options. This period had a huge positive for these older titles as well as VanillaWare. Not only would some of VanillaWare's most well-regarded titles receive a beautiful facelift, but they'd also get more attention outside of Japan thanks to the rise of internet and niche gaming more generally. As more people became receptive to niche games period, all the titles that were previously overlooked developed a cult following. VanillaWare's classic library was among these titles. The previously mentioned Dragon's Crown played a role in establishing a fanbase for VanillaWare on the PS Vita already, hence the market for two of these three upcoming titles already existed. Ultimately, three of their older titles would receive full remakes or remasters for HD PlayStation consoles. If you've heard of VanillaWare, you've likely played one of these titles already, or if not, may have summoned them in your backlog and or wishlist, myself included. So let's do these releases in chronological order, starting with Muramasa Rebirth. Muramasa Rebirth, known as Obero Muramasa in Japan, was released on the 20th of March 2013 exclusively for the Vita in that region. This is widely considered to be the definitive version of Muramasa. VanillaWare updated the visuals so the game looks better than ever. Previously cut content from the Wii original, including four new playable characters, was restored as DLC bonus content under the name Dairog Genroku Kaikiktan. Finally, the localization was redone to be more faithful to the Japanese original. Unlike the Wii original, there were no changing publishers outside of Japan this time round. Axis Games brought the game to North America on the 25th of June that year, and also to Europe as a download-only title later that October. As mentioned earlier, this game is a Vita exclusive. It is this platform choice that is both the game's greatest blessing, but also its biggest curse. The Vita community is a very vocal one, and this is why many Vita fans consider Muramasa one of the best RPGs available on the platform. It is this attention and hype that further contributed to VanillaWare gaining more attention as a developer, alongside their other titles available on the platform. The curse, you can probably guess that, the Vita's small audience. This means that Muramasa Rebirth is not available on any modern platform officially at this point, making it an oddity among VanillaWare's most popular titles. This is also why North American physical copies are so expensive. Hence, fans wish to see Muramasa ported to other platforms, and VanillaWare are well aware of this demand. In a 2022 interview with Spanish gaming site Nintenderos, George Camitani was asked about the possibility of another port of Muramasa. English-speaking gaming press picked up the following answer once Nintenderos published their interview, so Nintenderos produced an official English translation for themselves, which they provided to Nintendo Life. Camitani said, I think we would. I too would like to port Muramasa, but there are issues there that I won't go into. Our priority now is to start on the homework that has been piling up on us, meaning get to work on the games that we've been planning to make. While George does not go into any detail as to what these other issues are, it's safe to assume Muramasa will not be re-released anytime soon, which is a shame. However, it's worth noting that Vita emulation has come a long way, with multiple users reporting as of late 2023 that Muramasa Rebirth is fully playable on the Vita 3K emulator, meaning you can experience the game in some form without needing to buy a Vita or PSTV. Here's to an official release happening eventually though, because this game deserves a new, modern audience. The next, and arguably the most important, re-release is Odin Sphere Life Razir. Of all of VanillaWare's remasters, Life Razir is more of a full remake than anything else. It was released for all available PlayStation hardware at the time, PS4, Vita, and the PS3 in Japan on the 14th of January 2016. Yep, a PS3 game in 2016. And physically too. Unlike most Atlas published remakes, no new story content was added for this expanded release aside from rewriting previous lines. Instead, gameplay and graphical differences took centre stage. There are so many to list, so I'll just give some examples here. 
new stages were added, enemy and boss AI was redesigned, and various other improvements designed to fix the flaws of the original while making the gameplay closer to more recent titles such as Dragon's Crown. Additionally, the artwork was remastered into HD with a high resolution, impact ratio and other visual upgrades. However, because much of the artwork was already in HD before being reduced for the PS2, this process was much easier than you'd think. Some things like character faces were redrawn by Kamitani, However, the majority of the graphical remasters focused more on ensuring the visuals were displayed as they were originally created with all those pen tablets and digital software back in the mid 2000s, which is really cool. This version of Odin Sphere is widely considered to be the definitive way to experience this classic title. For those of us who are not a fan of the Life for Zero enhancements, the PS2 original is included as an optional extra. Additionally, given this title came out at the height of the mid 2010s, it became a popular title, especially among the Vita fanbase. By this point, the Vita fanbase evolved into the small but powerful community it's remembered as today, in part spurred on by the positive reception of both Muramasa Rebirth and Dragon's Crown. Additionally, with the PS4 beginning to increase in popularity, Odin Sphere Life Vizier became an essential title for JRPG fans looking for something new to play. Regarding the localization, the original English dub was replaced with professional voice actors, putting it in line with the high quality dubs Atlas USA are known for, otherwise it's basically identical to the original release. Even the European language translations were included. The European release was handled by NIS America this time around, although this would mark the last time NIS America and Atlas would work together. This news was quite concerning for European fans at the time, which I remember firsthand. NIS America were the most reliable localization partner Atlas ever had with regards to the PAL region, especially as Atlas went through a slew of other companies, including Square Enix publishing the original version of Odin Sphere, as I mentioned earlier. At the time, Deep Silver had yet to reveal itself as the new publisher for Atlas titles in Europe. But putting all that aside, Odin's Fear Life Vizier was arguably one of the, among the best possible games for NIS America to end their long publishing history of Atlas titles with. NIS America published Odin's Fear Life Vizier for PS4, Vita, and PS3 in Europe on the 24th of June 2016, two weeks after Atlas themselves published Odin's Fear in North America, and VanillaWare's future and fanbase would only grow from here. The final re-release is Dragon's Crown Pro, which was developed exclusively for the PlayStation 4. Releasing in May 2018, this is one of a handful of remakes Atlas localised for the West that year. Compared to these other remakes, Dragon's Crown Pro has fairly minimal changes compared to the original releases. In fact, the PS3 and Vita originals actually got patches in preparations for Pro's release. That's how minimal the changes are, so I'm going to be brief. The majority of the upgrades were technical, such as visual enhancements for both 4K resolution and PS4 Pro, as well as redrawing some portraits to reduce dragged edges that players can easily spot. Crossplay and cross-save with the original PS3 and Vita versions was also a key part of this re-release, meaning if you were one of 9 PlayStation fans who didn't already upgrade to a PS4 yet, you could still play with your friends who did upgrade. Additionally, Azusa Shiba rearranged the game's soundtrack via a live orchestra. This OST was released physically in the Japanese limited edition as well as on iTunes. Finally, all prior DLC and patches are included as standard alongside both English and Japanese audio. Dragon's Crown Pro is widely considered to be the best way to experience one of VanillaWare's most popular titles to date. Plus, it is possible to play this game on modern hardware as well by tracking down affordable physical copies for the PS4. If Dragon's Crown was to ever be ported again in the future, it is likely this version will be used as the base. Now with outlined re-releases, it's time to return to 13 Sentinels itself. This order also fits chronologically, given full production for 13 Sentinels began after both Muramasa Rebirth and Odin Sphere Life Razir were released. So why did 13 Sentinels take so long? Well one reason is that 13 Sentinels originally started life as a proposal for a toy line. It was also planned to be far less ambitious in comparison to Dragon's Crown, although this soon changed once the project entered production. Due to Atlas's right of first refusal for VanillaWare's next project, as per their publishing agreement for Dragon's Crown, Kanatani had to pitch the game to Atlas first. Fortunately, Atlas accepted the proposal immediately, minus the toy line. Multiple noteworthy facets of 13 Sentinels' identity differentiate it from all other VanillaWare titles. The first is the setting, which is a hybrid of both science fiction and 1980s Japan. Both of these settings were chosen due to Kanatani's desire for a different setting from the usual fantasy, alongside his lack of familiarity with modern Japanese high schools. The second is a heavy influence of both shoujo and mecha, two genres VanillaWare have not made games in before. The shoujo influence mostly shows through the game romance systems, whereas the mecha theme exists because Kanatani wanted to create a modern classic for the genre. Another unique feature is the usage of 13 different protagonists. Yep, 13 different protagonists. 
They all have their own stories and character arcs and overlap as part of 13 Sentinels wider narrative. The way these stories and characters interact, grow and connect to each other is considered the best part of 13 Sentinels. As for the gameplay, 13 Sentinels is widely considered to be an RPG visual hybrid despite VNDB's hypocrisy in the movie existing, even though there are many other visual or gameplay heavy games elsewhere on the website, such as the Ace Attorney series. There are three gameplay portions. The first, Remembrance, is where players explore side-scrolling 2D environments adopting the role of one character. These sections closely resemble previous vanillaware games in terms of aesthetics and atmosphere. In these scenes, you can also make choices that affect the outcome of those scenes and watch events that occur in real time regardless. The second gameplay portion is the Destruction Mode, these gameplay segments mostly resemble real-time strategy games, where the cast has to use the Sentinel mechs in order to defend the terminal from hordes of kaiju. It's quite unique and easier to get when compared to Grim Grimoire. The final portion of analysis is the game index, where you can read up information on people, items and other things within the in-game world. It's also possible to see which narratives you can play at certain points in the game, and of which are locked. As you can tell, 13 Sentinels was so different from any of Vanillaware's other works that it risked becoming a victim of false expectations, especially from those who played the likes of Odin's Sphere and Dragon's Crown. This is where two of the quirks of 13 Sentinels' identity came into play. The first is the 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim Music and Art Clips paid prologue package. Yep, a paid demo. This release contains exactly what it says on the tin, alongside a PS4 theme and Avatar DLC set. And most importantly, a physical copy of the demo. It is possible to buy the demo digitally by itself, which did come out in Japan alongside the fiscal release on the 14th of March 2019. Atlas said that this demo's purpose is to help give fans an understanding on what to expect with 13 Sentinels gameplay. However, if you ask me, I think the other reason the prologue demo exists was that Vanillaware really needed the money to help offset 13 Sentinels development costs. Bear in mind that they hadn't released a new game at this point in many years, and given how much the studio has struggled financially in the past, it makes sense. Also, collector editions are easy money because collectors worldwide will import. Ask me how I know. As for the second release quirk, Nostalgia Bait. In Japan, Atlas released a PS4 port of the PSV version of Princess Crown alongside the full game as an early purchase bonus. Download codes for this re-release were also added to collector's editions for the full release of 13 Sentinels. Much like Persona 4 Dancing All Night's PS4 port, Atlas did not release Princess Crown's port separately anywhere else. In this case though, it does make sense. Putting aside the fact Princess Crown is an old game, a separate release would further fuel demand for a western localization of Princess Crown for the PS4. As I've already discussed earlier, this sadly isn't possible. Regardless of the situation with Princess Crown, that didn't detract from 13 Sentinels finally releasing on the 20th of November 2019, after 6 years in development. That is a landmark achievement for Vanillaware, as it was the longest time they spent working on a single project at that point. As for the western localization, Atlas didn't release it until the 22nd of September 2020, in part due to the impacts of the still ongoing panoramic. This game is one of the few English dubbed localised Japanese vision novels. The English voiceovers were added in a day one patch for the PS4 release as a response to this delay. Much of the game's English dub was recorded remotely using a combination of conference calls and home setups. To celebrate the game's original PS4 Western release, George Kanatami reflected on the game's development. It's quite a lengthy message, so I'll share the most impactful part here. He says, after pouring in what felt like an immeasurable amount of work and time, and all we have here at Vanillaware, I consider this title to be an amalgamation of everything within me, a combination of all my past experiences and creative skills, packed with my feelings and respect for my inspirations. In truth, I doubt we'll ever be able to create a game the same way we did this one. I can't say for sure how much a sci-fi coming of age story set in Japan will resonate with the rest of the world. Still, I'm sending this game off with my head held high, knowing we crafted something worth taking pride in, a game I truly feel is Vanillaware's best work to date. I sincerely hope everybody who plays this game enjoys it as much as we did making it. And enjoy it they did. 13 Sentinels is one of those rare games where the long protracted development cycle really paid off. This game became a critical and commercial success, selling 1 million copies as of August 2023, in part thanks to a late Nintendo Switch port on the 12th of April 2022. Critics and players alike consider the characters, story and presentation the best parts of the game and overshadow the weaker RTS gameplay sections. Additionally, many Japanese creators including Yoko Taro and Masahiro Sakurai have openly praised 13 Sentinels. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. While Vanillaware built a fantastic game, 
word of mouth is really what sold it. Nowadays, both Japanese RPG fans and fusional fans alike love the game, and when you get both fan bases in equally enjoying a hybrid title like this one, you're truly on to a winner, especially when it comes to a genre as niche as visual novels. Overall, while the legacy of 13 Sentinels is still being written, it's safe to assume this game would influence a new generation of sci-fi lovers just as Kanatami intended. It's still the most unique title in Vanillaware's library, especially once you exclude Japanese exclusives, and will likely remain so going forward. The final remaster developed by Vanillaware as of this video is for Grim Grimoire. Titled Grim Grimoire Once More, this remaster came out in Japan for the PS4 and Switch on July 28th, 2022, before being released in North America on 4th of April 2023 and in Europe later that week. A PlayStation 5 port was added for the worldwide release, marking Grim Grimoire once more Vanillaware's first native PlayStation 5 title. This release came to fruition because of Vanillaware staffer named Yoshio Nishimura who joined Vanillaware due to his love of the original Grim Grimoire. He pushed for a remaster to happen, which Nippon Issue Software subsequently approved. This remaster added quite a few features, although much like Dragon's Crown Pro, the core foundation of the game remained the same. These features include quality of life aids like fast forward, an art gallery, difficulty setting adjustments, new familiar skills and skill trees. The Japanese voice track was also re-recorded as the only PS2 voice recordings that they still had were not very good quality. While the original PS2 release definitely slipped under the radar, once more appears to have also slipped under the radar as well. Although this remaster hasn't been available outside of Japan for very long at the time of this video, I don't really see many people talking about it. This is despite Vanillaware's surge in popularity since the original release, as well as a Nintendo Switch version. Although, this relative obscurity is partially down to how niche Grim Grimoire is to begin with. This doesn't mitigate the fact this remaster existing at all is a good thing. Period. It was always unlikely Grim Grimoire would ever return due to the original's poor performance. It goes to show how the market for niche RPGs has grown a lot since the original release. This likely factored into NIS approving the remaster. It also opens the possibility for continuing the series like Kanatami originated back in the day. For those interested in checking out this obscure gem from Vanillaware's library, this version is the one to play. At the time of this video, it's still affordable physically through Shop Around, as well as via the Nintendo eShop and the PlayStation Network. Finally, we get to Vanillaware's most recent title, Unicorn Overlord. At the time of writing this video's script, Unicorn Overlord is not out yet, so I'm going to be brief here as I may cover it on the channel in the future, whether in its own video or in an update to this one. Plus, it's too early to say what the future legacy of Unicorn Overlord will be. However, there's already plenty to talk about, so let's get into it. Vanillaware first teased this project as part of a hidden teaser trailer within the 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim Prologue paid demo package in 2019. So it's easy to assume Unicorn Overlord was in the pipeline for a long time before then, and that's because it was. Some of Unicorn Overlord's history is already publicly available via a 2023 Famitsu interview that came out at the time of the game's reveal. Originally conceived by Vanillaware staffer Takufumi Noma way back on the 7th of March 2014, this game had an almost 10 year development cycle to the day from conception to release as a result of all of Vanillaware's other projects I've already talked about. At one point, Noma had to assist with programming 13 Sentinels even after production fully started. Noma himself would go on to serve as Unicorn Overlord's director, programmer and lead artist, the latter of which was a huge first for him despite being an artist for many years. This game is basically Tagafumi Noma's baby, so to speak. So as for Unicorn Overlord itself, this game is a tactical RPG set in the world of Fevrif. This war-torn constant is being destroyed by, well, war, and players must play as Prince Elaine as he seeks to retake his kingdom from the evil General Valmor. The gameplay is split between moving units of troops across the various maps as well as managing combat battles between them in real time, the perspectives of which resemble both side-scrolling perspectives like Odin's Fear and the top-down perspectives of 13 Sentinels. There is also cooking, beautiful hand-drawn art, and even an online multiplayer arena. This game appears to be a great experience that RPG fans worldwide can easily get into. Unicorn Overlord already has a couple of unique achievements. Not only is Unicorn Overlord the first Vanillaware title ever to come to Microsoft's Xbox, but it's also the first Vanillaware title to get a simultaneous worldwide release on 8th of March 2024, excluding 13 Sentinel Switch port. Both these achievements are part of a wider trend within the Japanese game industry that favours worldwide releases on multiple platforms compared to the previous platform exclusivity popular with Japanese developers. Alongside the Xbox X and S versions, Unicorn Overlord is also coming to the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 and the Nintendo Switch. 
at least Atlas learned from Soul Hackers 2 because this game is actually on the Switch as well. Editing Miller chiming in from early April, aka months after I first researched this video and put the script together to update because we can now officially take an educated guess as to why VanillaWare will not officially support PC. And I'm also adding some other bits of information that I can't really leave out of this video. In a recent interview with Destructoid, Atlas producer Akiyazu Yamamoto was directly asked why Unicorn Overlord is not coming to PC at launch and whether a PC port will arrive later on. He said, as a publisher, we would like to deliver it to PC users as well, but per our agreement with VanillaWare, we are only releasing on console. In other words, there are no plans to port it to PC currently. While he doesn't directly say it, many fans believe that Yamamoto confirms that VanillaWare is the one blocking a PC release of Unicorn Overlord and by extension their older titles, most likely due to studio policy against PC. Given how Japanese developers tend to be stubborn regarding changing platforms from what they're used to, among other things. This isn't surprising. However, much like other developers who refused to support the Nintendo Switch in the early years of its life, or still aren't if you're Aqua Plus, their lack of PC support is untenable. Sooner or later, they will have no choice but to officially support PC. That's reality. Additionally, while I'm here, I'd also like to mention that Unicorn Overlord has sold over 500,000 copies, very impressive for any strategy RPG, as of early April 2024. Additionally, George Kamitani confirmed in a now deleted tweet, most likely because he probably wasn't allowed to say this, that VanillaWare ran out of funds during both Unicorn Overlords and 13 Sentinels development. In other words, he confirms my theory regarding the demo release I mentioned earlier. Anyway, back to what I scripted two months ago. Speaking of console platforms, now's a good time to talk a bit about VanillaWare's future. One thing that's become apparent throughout this video is that none of VanillaWare's games are available officially on PC. Sure, you can emulate, and for some of the older Japanese only titles, it's the best and only way to play them nowadays. However, in terms of official products, VanillaWare is a console exclusive developer. Even Grim Grimoire and Muramasa, owned by companies known for porting their titles to PC, are still console exclusive. This is quite strange, and VanillaWare is aware of the demand for official PC ports, as I touched on earlier regarding Muramasa Rebirth. Additionally, the majority of VanillaWare's older titles are still exclusive to PlayStation consoles, especially the titles published by Atlas. Because Unicorn Overlord is coming out across all major consoles soon, this reception may open the floodgates for ports for VanillaWare's older titles on other platforms. The Nintendo Switch, as well as PC, are particularly viable platforms for the kind of games VanillaWare makes, and I personally think they would do very well although I would like to see them across all major platforms, including Xbox. Regardless of whether VanillaWare's older games ever get ported though, that doesn't detract from their legacy. VanillaWare is a trailblazing developer, choosing firmly to remain rooted in the roots of 2D gaming or while continuing to innovate in their own way. They have firmly left their mark on the industry. I'd go as far as to argue that VanillaWare's legacy is on par with the Black Oinks, the very PC-88 RPG that inspired George Kamitani when he was a young boy all those years ago. VanillaWare has inspired a generation of creatives, equally amazed the generation of RPG fans, and proven to the world that side-scrolling 2D games have a future in the era of 3D gaming. Other 2D titles that adopt similar hand-drawn art styles and gameplay to VanillaWare's titles have been compared to VanillaWare's games. You could call them VanillaWare-likes if you will, it's not a full-on subgenre like, say, Metroidvania, but a label existing at all is noteworthy. Some games have had these comparisons before include the likes of Sakuna and Rice and Ruin, as well as Dust and Elysian Tale, both great games in their own right. And of course, we can't forget from its similar games actual VanillaWare staff worked on, like Grand Kingdom and As Libra. Additionally, thanks to the rise of internet, VanillaWare greatly benefited from word of mouth as well as new ways for publishers to promote their games, meaning both the company and their titles became more popular. While I did touch on this already with the Vita fanbase, it's not just them. The rise of niche gaming sites, content creators and social media met fans across all platforms are becoming aware of just how good VanillaWare's games truly are. When you combine this with VanillaWare shifting development to the PS4 in the mid-2010s and then the Nintendo Switch in the 2020s, it's safe to conclude that VanillaWare's fanbase has never been as big as it is now. This effectively secures the studio's future, a stark contrast to what Kamitani and co faced at the turn of the millennium. Another part of VanillaWare's legacy I haven't mentioned yet is their continuing long-term partnership with Bassiscape, a company who has composed the music for the majority of their titles. Originally founded in 2002 by composer Hitoshi Sakamoto of Final Fantasy Tactics and 12 fame, 
Face Escape originally started with himself, Masahiro Iwata, and Minabu Namiki. Over time, Base Escape expanded with other fellow veterans, including Masahiro Kaneda, Kimihiro Abe, Noriyuki Kamikura, Yoshimi Kudo, and Azusa Chiba. All of these veteran composers have assisted Villaware soundtracks in some form, including Odin Sphere and 13 Sentinels. Moving forward, Vanillaware appears to be operating on a dual development pipeline. This is something that Kamitani talked about wanting to achieve back in the 2013 Full Game interview, but said it'd be challenging due to the need to keep the studio small and maximise autonomy. Additionally, Kamitani stated he wishes to stick to console game development and not move to smartphones. Fortunately, it seems Vanillaware achieved this dual development pipeline in recent years. Vanillaware has managed to balance working on newer titles like Unicorn Overlord, as mentioned earlier, this is not directed by George Kanatani, alongside both 13 Sentinels and all those re-releases of their older games. This bodes well for the future, both in terms of all new titles from different staff at Vanillaware, as well as further re-releases of their back catalogue. The company has a bright future ahead, and just like Vanilla Ice Cream inside a freezer, Vanillaware will remain around for many years to come. I'm going to close this video out with a quote from Kentaro Onishi, who, when asked to provide an insight into what working at Villaware is like, gave this answer as part of his response, which I think really sums up Villaware's brand. Not just how they achieved it, but why their company holds such regard from fans across the globe. Also, one idea that George Kamitani constantly brings up is that of company branding. Nowadays, there are many free diversions like smartphone apps, video sites, and social media. If you want to kill time, there are many ways to do it, and within that sphere, console games are relatively expensive. If you don't enjoy the game you spent good money on, you won't buy another one. In the worst case scenario, you may end up disliking games and never touch one again. We don't like that outcome and we want the person to say, I like this company's games, so I'm going to buy this. All of us believe that we can make our own futures. Hello, and thanks for getting to the end of my latest video. Seeing as you've already seen this image five minutes ago with different text, I'll be brief this time. This video took much longer than I expected, as it's my longest one I've ever made to date, and it's the first informational retrospective made in my new editing software. I'm happy with how this video has turned out in spite of all these challenges. As for my next informational retrospective, that's a while off, because I'll be working mainly on review content, as well as other things relating to the environmental impacts of gaming. That said, I'll confirm now it will be on another Otome developer, and based on what I've researched so far, I think you'll like it even if you don't play Otome games. So with that said, thank you for watching, please like, subscribe, comment, become a channel member if you want to and can afford it, share this video around, etc. You all algorithm boosting stuff. Thank you so much and have a lovely day. Bye bye.